Uh, off yet, uh, especially with uh, last night's event. Uh, as Don said, thanks for all your help and, uh, and attention. Everyone was working, in, uh, it was awesome watching everybody work yesterday, and the questions and everything were awesome. We're going to pick up today with uh, desired state configuration again. Uh, we're going to talk today primarily about configurations and environmental data. Um, the button is okay now? The button is okay. Don pressed it to begin with, so we're good, we're good to go there. Um, so, me, I'm, you know, I work at Chef, I'm an MVP, I like DSC, and I'm on Twitter and all over the place, so you can find me. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the local configuration <coughs> manager, which is what applies our configurations. We're going to look at the basics of creating a DSC configuration, how we can parameterize that so we can reuse our configurations, and then how we can take and use our configuration to model the structural view of how our server should look and how we can then take and apply environmental data so we could have a similar looking environment for like dev, test, production. You know, novel idea, but yes, we can do that. And we don't have to do a whole ton of rework to make that happen. So that's, that, that's my hopeful agenda for this, after, for this morning. Um, as always, as we're going through, if you have questions, ask them, and we will dig in. Before we get into that, um, this has come up in a couple of conversations over the last day or so. Um, I just wanted to kind of kind of set the stage for why this DSC stuff is important and why the, why the concepts around configuration as code is important. Uh, there's an interesting blog post out there: six weeks to provision a VM. Um, there are a lot of things hitting the media in our industry at this time. Um, you're hearing about you know, what companies like Amazon and Netflix are doing, but there's also large organizations like GE Healthcare and uh, GE Capital Management and Disney and Target and all sorts of large organizations that are undertaking some of these DevOps concepts and initiatives and they're seeing things like Don's article, uh, so, so Long IT Pro, which references uh, an article about full stack engineers in CIO Magazine. Puppet Labs, you know, they do a, uh, the last couple of years they've done a state of DevOps report. And we're going to look at a few things out of that uh, very quickly before we jump into the configurations. This year's the first year for the DevOps Enterprise Summit, where large organizations are getting together to talk about how they are implementing DevOps concepts to, uh, it, you know, to make their businesses succeed. The reason this stuff's important is because, in large part, because of cloud. And you have management, C-level execs, upper-level management guys, they're out there seeing what other organizations are doing and they're reading in the trade, trade magazines what's going on. They're wondering why, it, in an hour with a credit card and a and a couple of API calls, they can stand up a new load balanced environment in Azure, when it takes six weeks to get a single test machine from their internal IT department. <coughs> and as as IT professionals who support organizations, our goal is to help businesses win. And if we can't be, we can't provide some additional value on top of what cloud has internally, we have some issues. We also need to be able to take advantage of cloud where it, where it matters. And things, tools like desired state configuration make that much more possible. Because now I have my configuration document. I don't care where that machine is. It can be in Azure. It can be in AWS. It can be in Rackspace. And I have model. It can be in my own internal data center. I have a model for how to set that up so standing up and spinning up new machines becomes much less of a much <coughs> less of an issue. But you might not be seeing it today in your in your enterprise. So, some are, um, but you will be seeing this. I'm not going to read this whole section, but I do want to call out um, a little bit from from this. <coughs> High-performing organizations are deploying code 30 times more frequently with 50% fewer failures than their lower-performing counterparts. F IT failures are expensive. 
very often because IT projects are huge. The, I mean, the, the cost to business for failed IT projects is a lot of money. Um, I, have a, I have another talk I do where it, the, it's in the trillions for what IT, pro, uh, IT project failures can end up costing business. And that's because IT projects tend to be very high return. Um, but organizations, high performing organizations as found by this report, suffer 50% fewer failures. That adds up to money saved by organizations. That's money that can then be you know, plowed back into new initiatives. That makes a lot of sense and that makes a, uh, that, that's a, a very powerful case for executives. Something else called out by that report. High performing IT organizations have several, uh, several practices that kind of correlate to strong throughput and strong stability. One of the key things there, version control, version control, version control. Who here uses some sort of version control in their environment? Awesome, this is the best response I've had yet. Uh, if you're not using version control in your environment, I'm not mad at you, it's okay. <laughs> but if I come back to this conference next year and see you and you answer the same way, you are doing your jobs wrong. You are failing as a professional because version control is an extremely important part of our workflow. We, we put a lot of our intellectual effort, a lot of our company's time into developing the scripts and configuration documents and things that run our enterprise, we should treat those professionally and put them in some sort of version control so we have a history, we have the freedom to make changes. Um, version control, it will. if you're not using it now, go out, start playing around, try a couple of them. There's some free ones out there. It is not hard to get started. It will make a big difference in your career. And it bubbles up and it shows. Organizations that have high-performing IT organizations, version control tends to be a central thing in their organization. Then there's a section on recommendations for improvement, and I just grabbed one item out of there because this is something that's kind of near and dear and applies to the whole infrastructure as code concept. And that's, we need to keep evolving our skill set. And you guys know this, that's why you're here. Uh, that's the whole point of the PowerShell Summit is so that you can take and dive deeper and learn more uh, about one of the key technologies to making your environments work. Well, not everybody gets that. And it doesn't necessarily stop at learning PowerShell. Learning new skills, learning new languages, diving deeper into languages you know, learning different patterns for doing things, like writing unit tests, you know, I encourage you all to pay strong attention to Jim's talk later around unit testing. Now, that, that's a very key concept to learn, especially if you haven't touched it before. You know, one of the things that we've seen in the IT industry, uh, those high-performing organizations, they tend not to have a traditional sysadmin role. They're kind of evolving into this concept of site reliability engineering. And site reliability engineering is actually taking software development practices, is taking a software engineer and applying those techniques and technologies towards managing infrastructure and dealing with those problems. Um, at Google, the site reliability engineers, they're dinged if they spend more than 50% of their time firefighting. They should be spending 50% time or more building tools to keep them from having to firefight. And to man so they should be able to you know, self-provision, self-heal their infrastructure. And that is, I think, a very strong, um, it should be a very strong direction for our industry. You know, I don't want to be paged in the middle of the night, and now in my new role I don't, but when, it, when I was in an operational role, I hated getting paged at night or on the weekend. You know, it takes you away from your family. It's not a... You know, it, it's, it's not a pleasurable experience. So if we can put in tools and systems that help minimize that, that, make us, that makes things that much better for us. All right, let's get into DSC. So 
So first off, we have our local configuration manager. And the local configuration manager does a few key things. Um, there's some additional settings, and depending on if you're in version 4 version 5, you're going to have uh, slightly different settings available. But some of the key things that the local configuration manager, the agent that applies our configurations, uh, does, is it lets us know, hey, should it, am I supposed to just get configurations pushed to me, or am I supposed to go out and actively look for them? Am I in a poll mode? Should I auto-correct the state of my machine or not? So th there's a few different modes that we can set the local configuration manager for. And one of them is apply and autocorrect. That's my favorite one. That's the kind of the self-healing infrastructure concept where every 30 minutes or whatever time interval you set, the local configuration manager will run, check the state of your system. And if it's out of compliance, it'll bring it back. <laughs> That's not going to fit every scenario. So there's two other modes that we can run in. There's apply, which just applies the configuration when you push it out there or when it pulls a new one. And then it doesn't do anything after that. And then there's apply and monitor, which will apply the configuration and then watch for divergence and just report it in the event log. So that might be more applicable to an environment where you have designated maintenance windows where you can contractually only modify system state in a period in a, during a certain period of time. How often I should recheck that consistency? Uh, by default, that's like every half hour, but you can change that. Um, the lowest <coughs> interval you can do is every 15 minutes. Um, well, the lowest interval you can do through the local configuration manager is every 15 minutes. Um, the local configuration manager is just a WMI API and it's using <laughs> task scheduler behind the scenes. So if you want to do something more frequently, you can. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because there is overhead on your system every time you run all those checks. So, so every 15 minutes is probably a pretty sane minimum. And then the last and kind of major common feature that we really, you know, that we really like in our local configuration managers can I reboot this machine or not? Very often, uh, things that we do to configure a system, or if Windows updates have run and there's pending file moves and things like that, systems need to reboot. Can the local does the local configuration manager have permission to reboot your nodes? This is kind of a uh, an important cultural decision in your environment. It's do we deploy software? in a resilient enough fashion that I can have nodes in my environment reboot kind of at will. Some, you know, some roles, like uh, when I was at Stack Exchange, I would never set reboot if needed on my SQL servers. Se you know, the always on availability groups are, are good, but they're not that seamless. So I want to have control over that. On my web tier, not a problem. I've got, you know, I've got nine production web servers, in play and I can run on two so go ahead reboot is necessary I don't care so you know it, it's it's cultural and it's context sensitive um, but that is a setting in the local configuration manager by default it, it does not allow reboot if necessary we're going to talk a little bit about some of the keywords and things, and then we're going to dive in and, and take a look at what a basic configuration looks like. So Windows Management Framework 4 introduced a couple of new keywords, uh, the configuration keyword and the node keyword. And uh, in that context, there's also an import DSC resource keyword. Um, it looks like a commandlet, but it's really a keyword. The important ones, though, to really... Oh, to really know our, this, our, our configuration and node. Configuration acts kind of like the function keyword, but not exactly. And then node is used inside of a configuration to identify, the config, to identify a particular machine or group of machines. And then we're going to look at how we define resources in the configuration and how we pass parameters down to them and how we can create dependencies. So let's actually look at some code here. Um. 
We'll start at looking at W at a machine with WMF four. Dim. Um, okay, so with Windows Management Framework 4, we've got our configuration keyword. So we just do configuration. And then we do a name of the configuration. And this is where we kind of start to diverge from how a function is declared. Uh, configurations cannot have a hyphenated name, they are just a single string with no uh, no separator there so it's not we don't have verb dash noun configurations so once we start off our configuration document the easiest most simple way we can do a configuration is without a node statement at all and by default, it would treat it as <coughs> the node be, the node being localhost. Um, that's not necessarily the, that's not necessarily the you know most the best practice to do, but that's also how we're going to uh, treat um, composite configs. So, yes. Very good. So, uh, so Jeffrey had it and uh, explained it much better there. The if, if you don't specify a node, it will be the node in context, and th that kind of sets the stage for composite configurations. Mm -hmm. And if there is no node in context, then it will default to localhost. And what node in context means is I can call configure I can call configurations from inside a configuration. And that's that's this concept of composite configurations. Composite configurations are treated just like DSC resources. And we'll see we'll see an example of that uh, or we'll we'll make an example of that very shortly here. So um, I'm just going to be very explicit. And say node localhost. And we'll do a file resource. So when we declare a DSC resource in a configuration, the syntax looks kind of like I'm declaring a function, kind of like I'm declaring a hash table. It's, it's much more similar to a hash table uh, than anything else because we'll declare key value properties or our key value statements to uh, fill out the parameters for those resources. If you're ever Kind of caught short wondering what resources are, uh, what the parameters are. Uh, number one, the TechNet documentation is still a little wonky. Um, and so sometimes, you know, things don't quite match up or parameters exist that, uh, parameters show there that don't exist or exam <coughs> the examples aren't quite right. Um, you always have get DSC resource. And there's a syntax parameter. And that will actually go through, take a look at the existing resources you have on your system, and from the metadata, give you the syntax for what that resource looks like. Uh, let's go up a little here. So, my file resource has a resource name, which is a string. And in this case, in my case, I'm going to be my sample file. I have to have a destination path. That's a mandatory one. <coughs> Everything else is kind of conditional. And you can see for things that have, uh, that are enumerations or that have validate set, that information will get 
push back out here. So we have you know our options for our attributes. We have our options for checksums. So this uh, get DSC resource with the syntax parameter is a very handy little tool to have in your toolkit when you're creating configurations. Uh, so you don't have to kind of remember all of the uh, all of the configuration syntax, uh, especially on WMF4. Uh, there is some IntelliSense in the ISE for this. Once you add a couple of custom resources, though, it's very wonky in w Windows Management Framework 4. I believe it's better in WMF5. We'll, s we'll see shortly when we uh, try, try this on WMF5. Um, it's still a bit wonky, but it's a lot better. Yeah. So once you start adding a lot of custom resources, IntelliSense, it, it gets a little tougher. All right, so destination path. We're just going to drop it right in the root of C. And we'll do contents. So with the file resource, we can do a lot of different things. We can uh, specify the content of a file, we can copy files from one location to another, create directories, all sorts of cool stuff. In this case, we're just going to do a nice simple example and see what we get. So, I have a configuration, I have a node statement, I have a, a DSC resource, What's going to happen when I run this? I got all day, guys, so. <laughs> it's going to create a MOF file? So when I, when I execute this statement here. Just define it. Right. So what this will do is it will define a configuration command. It doesn't actually create a document until we run that command. I have a question because I was yep. uh, trying to debug a resource yesterday. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get loaded. And so I looked into the, uh, the module for a PS uh, configuration yep. and saw that the, I guess the keyword calls a function which called configuration and I saw a parameter called uh, resource definition. Is there any way to pass those in? Because I can't get my resource loaded. I can do, I can do a get DC, uh, DSC resource. I can do a test DSC. I can do test schema. Everything <laughs> functions. But when I look in the ISE, I get the, the distinct color of a, a, of a command for uh, my resource. So it's not being interpreted as, as a resource, but as a command. And then it fails when it tries to execute it because uh, you can't find the command left or the function or whatever. Are you, uh, did you import your custom resource? Uh, so. Um, okay, anyway, yeah. maybe off topic, but. No, uh, when you use custom resources that are not in uh, PS Home modules, uh, so if it's not in C, Windows oh, yeah. System 32, V1. No, it's imported, yeah. Um, so that you need a import DSC resource statement in your configuration document to. Does the auto loading already take care of that though? Nope. So that so this is you have to be very explicit about what. And I'll show you how we use custom resources here in just a moment. We're gonna we'll step through this and then we'll add custom resources. But you actually need to be very explicit about what custom resources you add or any, what resources outside of that C, Windows System 32, uh, Windows PowerShell, V1 modules directory. Anything that's not in there, you have to be very explicit about what you load. Um, so let's, let's create this command. We'll get the mod file, take a look, and then we'll add a custom resource. So we're going to uh, run this guy. So I now have a configuration command. My PowerShell summit config. When I run that, I'm going to change directories here. Um, <coughs> When we run a configuration document, by default it will create a <laughs> folder in which to store all of the MOF documents. Though that folder will be named by default 
the name of your configuration file and it's created in the file system where you are at that point in time. So in my user directory right now, I am going to, it's going to create a folder called my PowerShell Summit config. And for every node that I've defined, it will create a MOF document. Um, I can specify where else I want that to go. There's an output path parameter um, if I want to put it into a different location. But by default, that's what it will do. And we can see we have localhost.moff. <coughs> and we get this moth document that's created. This is a serialized version of the full list of resources that we've defined for that node. Um, you'll have some metadata in here, what, machi what machine you're targeting, uh, the user that created it, when it was created, and what machine it was created on. It's all for tracing back and figuring out what went wrong or where, where a particular config came from. You'll also have embedded in the resource kind of where it came from in your configuration document, a resource ID, and what module and module version that the command came from. That's all useful stuff when you're trying to trace back and figure out what why something ended up in a configuration versus why it didn't. Um, as your configuration documents grow more complex, having this kind of stuff in there is definitely helpful to trace back. Um, as you do composite configurations, the resource ID will reflect that so you can see where those resources came from. If you change directories and execute it again, will it make a new folder with a new file? In it? Yes. Yep. Is your refresh rate rate set to high? I have, uh, <coughs> it's actually set to 59, um, but yeah, I, I, unfortunately, yeah, it's not the, uh, not the best screen resolution there. Um, all right, so we've got our MOF document. We can apply it. Um, maybe we'll get to that, but let's add a custom resource. So on this system, We've got a, I've got a few resources installed. And we're loading up, doing a little caching. Uh, this, the performance of that function gets a lot better in WMF5, by the way. So I've got some custom resources on top of what we have available by default from, uh, from, the, uh, w, from WMF4. So we're gonna change the power plan on this machine as well. So let's get DSC resource power plan. Those available yes. Yep. Um, all of these, uh, my, the firewall rule, network adapter, page file, power plan, scheduled task is broken, uh, execution policy and time zone, um, are all of available on GitHub. So the uh, scheduled task in, in its broken state is available there as well. Um, that needs some work. <laughs> I forgot I pushed that. <coughs> should have put it on the table yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I should have. Um, but no one's asking, no one's asked for that one other than me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, in order to uh, create my power plan, conf uh, use my power plan resource, I need to <coughs> specify power plan, a resource name, and then the name of the power plan that I want to set. So, get DSC resource found my resource. So, I should just be able to do power plan. And I should just be able to do name. Performance. All right. So I gave you a little hint as to what's going to happen, but what's going to happen here? 
I've specified my custom resource. Get DSC resource can find that resource. So I should be good to go, right? So let's, let's see what happens. I'm going to load up my configuration document. Yep, so we're going to say, uh, let's see, my PowerShell Summit config. Oh, red. Hard to read red. Um, but basically, I, I can tell you, I can sum it up for you. What it's going to say is the syntax coloring gives us a hint in the ISE. It's blue, like a command. So it's interpreting that as a as what a, as a command there, and that I'm passing going performance as a um, as a path to it, and then this is just a script block literal underneath it. It doesn't know that power plan is a resource because I haven't told it that you need to go look for power plan inside of a particular module. So I have to do import DSC resource. If you look for get help for import DSC resource, you're not going to find it. If you do get command import DSC resource, you're not going to find it. It is not a it is not a commandlet. It's a keyword that is in context of a configuration document, and it has to be done outside of a node statement. Uh, it will not. It it doesn't work properly in or it, it doesn't. The keyword is not found inside of a node state in, inside of a node block. So you have there's two prop there's two parameters to uh, this keyword. There's module name. And I could also specify the resource name if I wanted to be explicit about just, if I just wanted to you know, have one resource come in. Um, I'm just going to import the whole module. So why doesn't it have the keyword uh, color schema? <coughs> uh, import DSC resource? I don't know. I didn't write. <laughs> uh, that might be uh, more of a question for uh, one of the uh, PowerShell team folks. Um, but notice, after I've done this, import DSC resource module seconds and resource, power plant change color. It is no longer blue. It is now black, if you can't tell from the, uh, from the screen. It is now recognized as a resource. So when I run this, load my configuration into memory. I get a configuration document. So let's get rid of that and load it back up. So now I have a second resource defined. So if you're defining custom resources, and they're located in program files, Windows PowerShell modules, in order to get them into your configuration documents, you need to use that import DSC resource. Um, that is something that caught me up for a little while. And then uh, once I figured that out, all of a sudden things are working. You can see, so yesterday I talked to a number of you about the structure of our DSC resource. And at the at the root module uh, for that resource, in this case, it's Stack Exchange Resources with Power Plan being the uh, Stack Exchange underscore Power Plan being the full name of the resource. It lives in a module called Stack Exchange Resources. Stack Exchange Resources module has a version of 1.9.10. That is the version that all of the resources in that module care about. Not, not, a mod, not a version number associated to the power plan resource. And that's the importance of, that's why we have to have that PSD1 file in that root module. Is because that gets stamped in. And so when this, when, when this configuration tries to run, it will only run if the Stack Exchange Resources module with this version is present on the system. So if you're not in a pull server environment where it's pulling the correct version of the module, you have to make sure you have the correct version of the module for the correct configuration document. 
if you revved that version, you need to make sure you rev your configurations as well. That all makes sense? So why do I have import DSC resource? All right, it's a tough, tough morning here, guys. You know, there, there was coffee and everything outside the outside the room. So, so why is that? Why is that command or, or that keyword hidden? That means that you can't get help and you can't uh, find it, so it's not very intuitive. Probably because it only makes sense inside the inside the configuration document. That it, it's not. It doesn't do anything for you outside of it. Um, I don't know if it's actually in an about topic or not, but it's critical for custom resources. So. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Uh, so the when it comes to desired state configuration, the best documentation is the PowerShell team blog, and they do call it out in the PowerShell team blog <laughs> when you talk about uh, when they talk about resources, uh, and that is so. TechNet is kind of a bit of a mess. Um, it is, uh, but the PowerShell team blog has a th has pretty much the authoritative documentation around desired state config. Um, I would default to that first um, when you're look when you're looking for for documentation around around desired state configuration, um, and with the pace that they're moving at now, it's going to be very hard to keep all the documentation up to date. So. Um, so w the blog is the blog is a much faster way for them to get information out to us. Um, as far as why it's not a command lit um, and why there's not help, that was a design decision that I had nothing to do with, I, and I don't know the rationale behind. So I could I just guess. Uh, my, my 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 guess is that it doesn't really make sense outside of this location and configuration, <laughs> so it doesn't really need to exist somewhere else. Uh, yeah. this too is when you're in you know a switch <coughs> statement there's labels and breaks so it's more like learning a language there so the fact that it looks like a commandlet might make you think you can look at commandlet help but really the right place to look is uh, configuration language reference all right so uh, just to kind of summarize to make sure it gets on the recording a lot there's been a lot of work to make PowerShell better as a, uh, a, a to support domain specific languages, and with it, it's a keyword in you know with import DSC resources a keyword inside the configuration DSL the the configuration domain specific language, and um, there should be help for it, but it's it's a keyword inside that configuration. It looks like PowerShell so that we can kind of leverage our our our. Uh, memory of verb dash noun commands. Great. Let's, uh, all right, where's, ah, dependencies. So uh, one last thing that we're going to look at before we move on to the next section is there is no guaranteed order <laughs> in which these things will be executed. Um, right now they kind of execute serially so if you have resources that have to execute before other resources like I need to install 
the install the IIS feature before I create a website, we can actually make our resources depend on other resources. And so I can do depends on or depends. Depends on, yeah. And I give it the resource ID. that I want to depend on. In, in WMF4, you can only do dependencies between actual resources. In WMF5, you can also do dependencies between composite configurations and resources, or composite configurations and other composite configurations. Um, so uh, it will not in some case, in some contexts, it won't error if you try to, in WMF4 if you try to do a dependency between two composite configurations. Um, it will error if you try to do dependency between a resource and a composite config, um, but it just doesn't do anything. Um, it does in WMF5. So when we generate our, we'll create our new configuration. We'll rerun. our config and we'll reload our MOF document and then we get this <laughs> depends on section and you can depend on more than one resource and that's actually what happens when you depend on a composite config it'll, de it'll create dependencies for everything inside of it uh, but that means that my power plan will <laughs> never be set it'll never attempt to set my power plan until after my sample file gets created or checked and verified that it's in the right state. That also means that if I have resources that depend on another resource and that resource error, the first resource errors in applying, it will never get to applying that second resource. So if you want, you know, if you have a scenario where um, you have things that need, like you need to create a user account before you open the RDP port for it uh, uh, to allow management. You don't want RDP open until you've actually created or modified the user accounts on your system or changed groups or whatever kind of security configuration you needed to do. Uh, maybe you're enforcing password complexity or something like that. You want to use dependency to make sure that if, your, if one step doesn't happen, that second step won't happen either. Because again, we can't get, there's no guarantee of ordering inside the configuration outside of what you explicitly specify. Is there any checking for circular dependencies? Um, like depends on, depends on, depends on? Um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, is there checking for circular dependencies? Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I know with, uh, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm. I'm not sure. I. I haven't tried it. <laughs> yes. Uh, what if a uh, dependency requires a, a reboot? Can you figure that out? Yep. So um, one of the. Okay. One of the. Uh, elements of the local config manager is: Can I reboot this machine? What it will do is it will actually register a. It'll register a scheduled job when you, when you invoke a, a consistency check or when, uh, or when the task scheduler does, it registers the next one to occur. And so if I have a job that, or if I have a resource that requires a reboot, it reboots the machine, machine comes back up, the neck, it, it'll start from the beginning again and run through. And now everything that was configured beforehand, they should all test out fine. So it's just going to hit the tests and then it'll pick up where it left off to to continue on. And that's that's the whole concept of you know of this desired state configuration. It's this test and repair philosophy. It means if I get interrupted in the middle, I don't care because I'm going to go back through and I'm going to test everything and make sure that it's where I want it to be and what isn't in what what isn't in its desired state will eventually get there. It's this eventual model of eventual consistency. So, it might not kick off like the the, you know, instant machine restarts, 
but there there is a scheduled task register to to pick it up and do it do it again. Or go again. How would you would you integrate BSC with SCOM, for example, mm -hmm. as an extension for preparing things beyond restarting of services that SCOM does and so on? How would you integrate that? So, um, Scott, from, from one part, SCOM would be awesome for a, a DSC deployment because uh, you have the event log monitoring, and that's mm -hmm. important to, so you can see when things fail. And the, but as far as like restarting services, you can have anything else going ahead and doing that. The, it, depends on, it depends on your threshold for a service being down. If I have DSC running every half hour and a service fails, Immediately after a consistency check, I could be down for you know tw 29 minutes or almost you know almost a half an hour before I before DSC checks that service again. If I need something that's more reactive, then I need to look at some more active monitoring and <coughs> monitoring and remediation. If a half an hour is fine, because I have 15 servers in that pool and that are serving up that same service, and and my monitoring tells me. That that service is available, then then I don't care on, as much on an individual box. But if I have a kind of single point failure box that that service needs to be running, then I need to be more proactive about it. Yes. We do detect circular dependencies in far. Awesome. <laughs> so uh, going back a uh, minute uh, around circular dependencies, DSC does detect them and it blows up, and configuration uh, will not generate if there are circular dependencies. So. Good deal. All right, I got two minutes left. We got a couple questions. Okay, so a question about applying things. So let's say you got a service resource that says ensure started. Uh, you got a maintenance window. You're upgrading SharePoint or something um, that takes an hour to do. But your thing checks every half hour. You don't want it obviously to start the service in the middle of an install. Yep. Is there an easy way to just say, hang on a sec, just wait until I'm finished? Yes. Um, you can pause it. So it's, it's getting triggered by a scheduled task. So pause the scheduled task. Okay, so it's all just in the schedule. Well, no. Scheduled task is an artifact of the current implementation. That's going away. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you actually do is you, you, you basically control the schedule. Right now we don't have anything as sophisticated as maintenance windows. Basically you say, hey, do a continuous check. Okay, so the, then the other option then is yeah uh, to change your local configuration manager setting to, to not check not check at that interval. Maybe set it to two hours or something if your maintenance app windows an hour. Or can you just put it depends on so that they wouldn't actually start the service until the installation is done? Uh, it depends on how you're actually de deploying the application. So uh, if you're deploying the application through desired state configuration, kind of. The the problem is we don't have a uh, we don't have kind of this conditional uh, this conditional notification or our conditional actions or, or way to conditionally run resources. It's they always run. So if I have a if I need to stop a service, deploy software, restart a service, then I need to and my resources stop service, <coughs> deploy software, restart service. I can't conditionally do that when there's new software to deploy unless I push new configurations. So I'd have to, you know, and what you can do, I could push a configuration, that's my deployment configuration, which will stop a service, deploy a software, push it back. But that just doesn't quite feel right to me. That's more like a deployment script, um, in which case I could do it outside of DSC. But, can all I right. Two, can I make two points? Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll come up to I think that this is what's being recorded. So. Oh, so there's two interesting things. First off, as we do the kind of basic 101 of desired state configuration, we uh, often focus in on like really low level resources, file, service, etc. But in fact, the great power of, of desired state configuration is this ability to build higher and higher levels of abstraction and then combine them in different ways and it all just works, okay? And so particularly, where we had, you back to the code? <coughs> yep, you bet. So here, we've no specified a node, local host. 
right? And that's run within this executable configuration. Now it turns out you can run multiple of those things and have a node for the same node, a node declaration for the same node, all in the same run. And what will happen is we'll find them all and we'll aggregate all those components before making it together. So in other words, you don't have to define everything for this node in this one location. You can do a bit here, a bit in another script, and a bit in another script. And when you run them all together, we basically aggregate them before producing the document. Exactly the same thing happens for each one of the resources. So for instance, you might say within this node here, I'll define a firewall rule. But then in some other script, you'll define another firewall rule, and another script, another firewall rule. And when you run them together, we aggregate all the resources into a single thing before making it so. The big point about this is the correct way to organize things is kind of a, we're, we're gonna, all gonna find that out together as a community. But the basic components allow us great creativity in how to organize things. So that's one thought. The second thought, um, Steve started the conversation about DevOps and about high-performing organizations. One of the most interesting things about the DevOps community is their focus in on you and your work environment. In fact, I attended DevOps days here in Amsterdam early in the year, and there was an incredible amount of focus in on making the work environment more humane, more fun, more successful for the individuals, and how that correlated to better success and better deliverables for the customers. So I really encourage you to participate, get engaged in this DevOps community. It's not just about doing a better job for your IT. It's about having more fun at your job and making our work lives better. So it's really just some wonderful thinking. I encourage you to engage. Yeah, uh, on that topic, one of my coworkers recently posted, uh, uh, he, did, he did a talk at DevOps Days Toronto on uh, DevOps Against Inhumanity, and it's all about, um, it, it's all about making this, you know, making the workplace better, making it a more humane uh, environment, because getting paged at 3 a.m. on a Saturday when you have a family trip coming up or something is, it, it's not good. It, it's, it's not a good scenario to be in, and you want to, um, and you want to make, you want to make your work environment as pleasure, pleasurable as possible, because that tends to make high-performing organizations. It does, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, from the aggregation, uh, if you have a lot of uh, similar resources running or identical resources running, which one wins, or how do you determine yeah. which gets applied? So you'll actually have, um, you, if you have uh, like a file resource that has the same uh, file path, you're going to have an error in your configuration generation. Because if you have a resource that has the same key value, so certain, there's certain properties of a resource that are, are noted as key, va key properties. And those are, that's a unique constraint. And you can only have one resource affecting one key property. Uh, and if you have multiple, it will error and say, hey, you have too many things trying to manipulate this one target. And button. <laughs> One little uh, question. Yes. 